Today we're talking to Mr. Charles Maltz, the Managing Member and Chief Investment Officer of uh, China's Asset Management. China's Asset Management is a Seattle-based investment advisory uh, firm which manages three fund of funds portfolios that allocate to Asian managers. We're going to talk to them about their investment philosophy today and how they consistently manage to outperform 95% of all other Asian fund of funds. So, good morning, Charles. Thanks good morning. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome to Singapore. Thank you. It's a true pleasure to be here. Okay, yeah. So, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your, your background? Yeah. So, my partner, Pete Nickerson, and I launched China's Asset Management in 2008, quite simply to provide, at the time, U.S. investors better access to the tremendous wealth that's being created in China and the rest of emerging Asia. Um, we realized that U.S. investment managers uh, typically underestimated the vast difference in cultural and business practices between the U.S. and Asia. And as a result, they were using investment strategies that were appropriate for developed country markets but weren't suitable for emerging Asia. And generally, those investment strategies, because they weren't suitable, took on more risk than the managers were aware and, and missed out on the most lucrative opportunities. So we, we think we had a better model. You know, we specifically look for man, locally based managers in emerging Asia that have the expertise, the cultural awareness, the resources, and the ability to go independently evaluate the companies in which they're investing. And we specifically look for managers that have the boots on the ground capability to do a comprehensive due diligence. In doing this, in these inefficient capital markets, our <coughs> managers have a much better understanding of the intrinsic value the companies are investing in. It, and because these markets are so inefficient, uh, they have a big information advantage, make much better investment decisions, and that enables them to generate substantial long-term outperformance. Yeah. And which markets in particular in Asia are you looking at? So we have a, our first one was a China fund that focused on China. We launched that in 2009. We launched an India-dedicated fund in 2010 and we launched an Ajax Japan fund in 2013. That's interesting. Often people would start off at Asia first and maybe look at the specific countries later on. Why, why did you start with China? So my wife is Chinese and she has an active business. She's a producer where she brings uh, Chinese performers to perform in the United States. Mm -hmm. And a couple times a year, I would get over to China with her. And as you know, when you walk down a street in Shanghai or or some other city, you're just overwhelmed by, there's new buildings, a new subway line, and people are just rushing around trying to get rich, trying to get rich and make up for lost time. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I was, I was creating fund, domestic funds for a U.S. investment firm, and I decided that U.S. investors have enough local investment opportunities already. They don't need more of those, but they did need more exposure to the tremendous wealth that's being created in emerging Asia, and there weren't many good ways to do that. Mm -hmm. You felt that there was a lack of understanding from the U.S. side and what was going on in China and that you could provide opportunity to, to China through a fund of hedge fund vehicles? You felt that was the best way to sort of... Well, so, you know, if you're trying to invest in the United States, there are substantial hurdles, right? Yeah. As we've seen, you can't necessarily trust a Chinese company's financials. Mm -hmm. You can't rely on the regulator to protect your investment. You can't access onshore listed Chinese companies generally, right, up until very recently. Um, we formed our investment strategy to try to change those hurdles into competitive advantages. So we go find these locally based managers that because they're doing that on the ground due diligence, they don't need to rely on independent third party research. They're making their own decisions based on their own evaluations. So they're able to exploit those inefficiencies in the market and identify great companies that the markets either misunderstand, misvalue, or just completely ignore. And they're able to invest in these good companies at attractive valuations and then benefit from both rapid earnings growth mm -hmm. and multiple expansion as the markets become increasingly aware of that, that company's value. Yeah. So, so you feel that these managers which are going and I'm, I'm assuming meeting the CEOs of, uh, of these uh, onshore Chinese companies, yeah. they, they have a better handle of, of the accounts and what's going on. They're walking around the factories. They're really... You know, exactly. Putting... And so it's much more than just meeting the CEO. So these are locally based managers in Shanghai and yeah. Mumbai and Bangkok. Yeah. Uh, and when they find a company they're interested in investing in, they're doing more of a private equity style due diligence where they're talking to clients, they're doing their own market research, they're, they're validating orders with key suppliers, they're doing everything you need to do when you can't trust the company's financials. Yeah. And in a country like China, uh, when you can do that, you're much clearly able to distinguish the legitimate companies and stay away from the bad ones. And, and that's where you generate the outperformance. Yeah. You didn't mention Hong Kong. I mean, most of the uh, 
Greater China investing, hedge funds, Greater China being China, Hong Kong, and <coughs> Taiwan uh, tend to be based in Hong Kong. The lion's share and the, uh, the, you know, the service providers there, the investors are there. Um, it, it's a much easier place to set up. Do you tend to look for more onshore managers based in Shanghai, for example? Well, that's true. Um, and, and the reason for that is the onshore market's much bigger. So there's 3,000 publicly listed companies onshore. There's about 1,000 Chinese companies listed in Hong Kong. And the characteristic of the onshore company, there's a lot more private companies. A lot more of the big state-owned enterprises are listed in Hong Kong. And then the final thing is that onshore market's much more inefficient. And, and that's where our managers are able to generate their biggest outperformances, finding these companies that are doing great that no one knows about. And then exploiting those inefficiencies, investing, and then ben benefiting from what I mentioned, the earnings growth and the yeah. market recognition. And so it's easier to do that in the onshore market. And so we, we specifically seek out managers that can invest both onshore and offshore. Let's look at the performance a little bit. So prior to the financial crisis, the, the fund of funds industry was, it was quite successful, running about $850 billion. Um, average performance prior to 2008 was around 8%. Post-2008, it's more like sort of 4%. Um, and the industry has lost quite a lot of assets um, for various reasons. However, you, you know, your fund's done very well. You, you consistently have uh, double-digit returns. Why do you think that is? What are you doing that the rest of the industry is not doing? So I think there's a couple of reasons why our performance has been as good as it's been. And, and just to define that, our, our goal is to generate 500 basis points of outperformance per year on average. Our China and from the benchmark. We use MSCI as benchmarks. And our, our China and our Asia funds have generated on average a thousand, over a thousand basis points of outperformance per year. Our India has generated 700 basis points. And I think there's, there's a couple reasons for that. The, the first is that we're focused on Asia. And we think Asia is one of the few regions in the world where with an appropriate active investment strategy, you can still generate good alpha. Mm. So the developed country markets are pretty efficient. I think it's much harder to do that there. In Asia, you have rapidly growing economies. You have companies that are doing very well, but, but they're inefficient capital markets. So only the top 100, 150 companies have any type of institutional coverage. Mm. The rest, it's a black hole. And, and that's a big black hole. You know, India has 7,000 publicly listed companies. Mm. No one knows anything about number 5,000 except our managers who are there and have the ability to go identify this company and then do the on-the-ground due diligence to validate yeah. them. So I think one, one of the things is that uh, just Asia as a region is particularly well-suited to generate alpha if you have the appropriate strategy. Um, the second thing is, again, just our manager selection process. I think we've identified an investment strategy that works particularly well in, in, in Asia. So the ability to go independently about the companies gives you a big competitive advantage. And I think we've proved our model to date. So in our China fund, which is our largest fund, we've made allocations to nine funds so far in the seven years that's been in existence. Nine funds that we've had held for multi-years. Mm -hmm. Every one of those allocations has far outperformed the MSCI China benchmark during the time we've held the investment. So I think we've validated our manager selection process. Yeah. The second thing I think that uh, sets us apart is I think we've been very successful in identifying managers very early in their cycle so that we've been able to benefit from their optimum earnings uh, return generation cycle. So we've been the first or among the first foreign investors in many of our managers. So that's helped us. And then the sec third thing is that we have a really active allocation strategy. Yeah. And that, that means two different things. So for our Asia fund, we actively allocate between the different regions, which we identify as China, India, Southeast Asia, and Korea. And we base our allocations on two things. The most important is our manager earnings growth forecast for their portfolio companies. We found that when those are high, um, our funds tend to do well regardless of how the market does. So we pay attention to that very closely. The other thing that we look at is, uh, I mentioned Pete Nickerson, my partner. He's got a network of factories around Asia, over 20, that employ 120,000 employees in China, India, uh, Vietnam, and Indonesia. And his network provides us real-time data on what's, what he's seeing in those markets. And, and often what he sees and what our manager sees is contrarian. And 
you know, as an example, when we launched our Asia fund in 2013, um, our China managers were pretty bullish. They were expecting portfolio companies to grow earnings 30 to 40 percent on average across the board. But in the United States, we were reading a lot of negative press about China. And so to try to reconcile the two different differences, ask Pete, what are you seeing in China? Yes, wages are gr going up, but productivity is growing even faster. And so our, our Chinese factories had never been more profitable. So with his on the ground uh, kind of information and our China our manager's earnings growth forecast, we set our allocation strategy on a regional basis. Yeah. And then within each region, we identify investment strategies that are best suited for the market conditions. So when we think there's more upside potential, we'll look to allocate to more aggressive, long-biased, long-only type strategies. And when we think there's more downside risk, we'll allocate to more conservative, true long-short, absolute return type strategies. You're not only outperforming most Asian Fund of funds, you're also outperforming most Asian hedge funds. Most Asian hedge funds would be quite envious of your return profile. So, so does that mean you're allocating to sort of smaller, more, more, more nimble and, and possibly more risky managers? I mean, what's the average size of Asian hedge funds on your? On you your know, our probably average size is in between 250 and 400 million in AUM. But, but that, okay, so you've got some quite quite large managers in there. Then. So, we, you know, again, we've been successful in identifying managers early, but because these managers have been so successful, they've grown pretty big. And so, as an example, our first allocation when we launched a China's fund in 2009 was with a Shanghai-based manager that, at the time we invested, had 100 million in AUM. Mm -hmm. You know, they've been among the most successful managers since then, and they, they're now up to over 5 billion in AUM but we've had the benefit of writing them all the way up. And so, you know, our, our smallest allocation right now is about 20 million with a Korean manager. Um, our largest is 2 billion. Largest fund we're in is about 2 billion. But, you know, I think our sweet spots in the 35 million to 150, 200 million dollar range. Yeah. And are you worried about uh, volatility at all? Are your investors worried about volatility? They're happy to take some more volatility on, which I'm assuming you do, in order to generate um, you know, out outsized return. You know, if you handle volatility the correct way, it can be your friend. That's yeah. very challenging to do. But really, fortunes are made in downturns. And what we found is that our managers take advantage of downside volatility to be able to invest in great companies that previously have been too expensive. And when they're able to do that, over the next you know, two, three, four, five years, they generally do pretty well because they got into these companies at attractive valuations and then benefit from the reversion to means for the valuations and the high earnings growth. So um, volatility, you know, it, it's hard to stomach, but we, we try to emphasize to our investors that Asia is for long-term focused investors. There is going to be volatility. We don't know what's going to happen for, to the markets in three months, but if you're in the right companies at the right valuations over 18 months, 24 months, 36 months, you'll do pretty well. From a U.S. investors' point of view, are they interested in your story? Which kind of investors do you target? What, what's, what's the sweet spot? You know, it's been really interesting. So we've been doing this since 2008, and, and every time there's been a global macro, macro crisis, emerging Asia has taken a bigger hit than the rest of the world, up until Brexit. And finally, when Brexit happened, I think investors finally realize that Europe's a mess, U.S. markets are, are overpriced or appear to be overpriced, emerging Asia doesn't look so bad. And what we're experiencing with our investor base, and it's high net worth, it's family offices, endowments and foundations, you know, we generally get the same story, that they've tried Asia in a limited way in the past, they haven't been too successful, they know they need to now get bigger exposure, and they're looking for good ways to do that. Yeah. So that's encouraging for us. Thank you very much for joining us today, Mr. Charlesman. Thank you very much.